Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to um, this conclusive final session uh, where we will be talking about mobilizing youth networks and social movements in the multilateral system. So to put things into uh, the perspective a little bit, today there are an estimated number of 10 million NGOs in the world, all focusing on different challenges, working in different sectors and with various partners. The global NGO community is largely fragmented into tiny units and networks that are uh, organized by location, broad field and special interests. Combined, they represent a formidable untapped organizational resource, mostly working by themselves or in collaboration with other specialized agencies. They all share a common commitment to public action on behalf of humanity as a whole yet some of them lack appropriate organizational structures to act in unison. Strengthening global civil society represents a huge potential for bridging the gap between we the people and the multilateral system. I can personally speak of, from, from my experience being a member of Junior Chamber International, which is a large organization that was founded in 1915 in the US. It focuses on developing leaders for a changing world through being a global network of enterprising young leaders. It's a huge organization, like many, many other existings, that unites more than 150,000 individual members in 110 countries. So over the years, we have worked with hundreds of corporate partners, governments, organizations, including the UN, and we count amongst our members, Prince Albert II of Monaco, and who is also the honorary president of JCI Monaco, Kofi Annan, Tara Asa, President Kennedy. So as an organization, we are familiar with challenges related to aligning the vision and activities on all levels and working with all sectors of society to ensure impact. But the impact, as we all know, is made always and only on a local level by individual members. And that's what counts the most. And also, I think as mo most of our panelists, we're also speaking today with a, an entrepreneurial perspective, which I believe is also very important as we have this let's do it kind of approach. Together with the experience of building NGOs and from some of us from scratch, our group of panelists is very much result focused. So I have an honor to welcome a panel of very bright and different speakers who all come from various backgrounds and countries. But we are all united by the same goal. We ensure that the youth's voice is heard and represented. What I'd like to focus on today is to really dive into quite specific questions and have an open discussion that focuses on recommendations for our main topic. Then the organizers of the conference will analyze those recommendations and really distill them into actionable next steps. So without further ado, <laughs> I am, uh, I'm going to introduce our first speaker and I will start asking, asking the questions. So our sp first speaker is Hekke Sabasu, who is founder president of Green Hope Foundation. It's an environmental startup that educates businesses about sustainability. She's United Nations Human Rights Champion, winner of the 2016 International Children's Peace Prize, and winner of the first ever Voices Youth Gorbachev Schultz Legacy Award for Nuclear Disarmament. Hello, and uh, um, it's an absolute pleasure to, to, to have you here today with us. So I would like to start with a first question. How can the structure of the multilateral system be expanded to include a more formal and substantial role for the partic participation of civil society organizations, which include youth groups, subnational groups, academies, and enterprises? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. And it's wonderful to be here with all of you uh, today. I was 12 years old when I attended Rio Plus 20 in 2012 and the youngest international delegate at this Earth Summit. And I still recall the looks of incredulity on the faces of many adults and even some of the older youth as I spoke at multiple sessions and also as the youngest keynote at the press conference to commemorate World Day to Combat Desertification and Drought. And there were 50,000 delegates at this historic summit. And I find your question very relevant because at that time, what bothered and what still bothers me the most is the complete lack of inclusivity of children in this critical discussion about the future of 
our planet, about the future of children like me at the time. But that did not deter me for a moment, but in fact spurred me to be more vociferous, constantly rebutting the cynicism and bias with my knowledge and passion for sustainability. And it was a small victory for uh, all of us uh, calling for the institutionalization of ombudspersons for future generations and for the inclusion of all children when the Real Plus 20 outcome document said in clause 50 stated that the contribution of children and youth is vital to the achievement of sustainable development. And, you know, it took so much of effort and time just to get a text changed and include the word children in that document that on my return from Rio, I founded Green Hope Foundation to provide children and youth with a platform of engagement using education for sustainable development as a transformative tool that provides them with the knowledge, skills and behaviors to think and act for a sustainable future. And this was my rebuttal to that overtly bureaucratic structure that had so many barriers, which had been in place unchanged since 1945. And it was also in that same year that I got elected as global coordinator for children and youth at the United Nations Environment Program, making me the youngest person and the only minor to ever hold this position. But even with these credentials, I wasn't allowed to enter the COP negotiations in Lima in 2014 because the rule said that I had to be 18. And of course, even then I didn't give up. And after the whole youth fraternity rallied around me, an exception was made uh, for me to attend because the other UN bodies were aware of my work. So my point is that, and the answer to the question is that despite being a, over a billion strong, we weren't allowed inside, let alone allowed to discuss the agenda on the table. So it's this archaic set of norms which are completely colonial that need to be changed. And all the age barriers have been done away with, at least in the UN system, there exists this greater obstacle that continues to hinder multilateralism and the meaningful participation of displaced persons, of refugees, of migrant communities. And because even now a person's domicile isn't considered to define status, it's still one's nationality or passport. And more than a quarter of the world's population now lives in places away from their origin. Our world has more refugees than ever before. And climate change, rising sea levels, deforestation, loss of livelihoods, they're forcing millions of people each year to migrate to other regions and countries, and often with very limited documentation. But our processes of engagement and participation continue to be inflexible and rigid that make it extremely uh, difficult for those who are the farthest and really need to be heard the most. And the last point I'd uh, like to make is that, you know, a lot of the UN processes as well as the decision making forums continue to be based out of the West. And this poses tremendous challenges for organizations from the global South. And we need these colonial seats of power to be decentralized. Because if UNEP and UN Habitat can successfully operate out of Nairobi, then the question is, why can't other offices? And my views are based entirely on my personal experiences spread out over the last 12 years. And I've not been cowed down by the challenges, the bureaucracy or the patriarchy that I've faced because my work spoke for itself. And additionally, I had the education to empower me. But there are so many civil society groups who do not have the same support systems and they're obliterated by these unjust processes. And for me, while COVID has heaped innumerable challenges, it's at least opened up doors for digital engagement. But again, for this to be successful, we need the technological infrastructure in LDCs, in indigenous communities, amongst migrant and refugee communities so that they too can participate. And only then, once we solve all of these issues, can we truly have a multilateral system that actually represents the aspirations and needs of all stakeholders.
Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for this answer. Um, and I, I'd like to come back later to the to the point where, that you raised about digital support. And I would like to maybe make some connection with Luke's work as well. Thank you. Um, I would like to 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 present you our second uh, second panelist, uh, Jody Kaliti, head of partnerships at Youth Leadership Network. It's a group of young leaders whose mission is to extend a global youth network in order to connect the efforts of youth movements to strengthen the advocacy strategies and support the sustainable development goals. Jody has built her work ethic in a variety of roles, including strategy consulting in Dubai, advanced work for the White House under Michelle Obama, brand management for Under Armour. She's currently working as executive director at Librium Search Research Institute. Hi, Jody. Um, thank you for being today with us. And um, my, my, my first question that I wanted to ask you when I was reading about you and what you have done. So having this both kind of entrepreneurial hat and the social movement experience, how do you think the civil society organizations can work together with decision makers from business and align their vision to achieve tangible results? Great, thank you for that introduction. And the first speaker did a great job of setting the stage for everyone. So I'm really excited to be here. In regards to your specific question, I do find it interesting to be both on the business and entrepreneurial side and also help lead a nonprofit. As many of you guys know, these are very two different roles and two different types of organizations. And I think most importantly, what I've learned for success in both of these different positions and connecting them together is first identifying. So if you're in either business or an NGO is identifying what the gap is create a win-win for both institutions. Most likely businesses like my own will not want to participate with an organization unless it's a clear win-win for their for-profit organization. Some way that we can start identifying the needs here is kind of look at the main problems. Is it systemic? Is it intergenerational? Is it because of geographic, geographical locations? As speaker number one mentioned, a lot of things are towards the West. And so how do we get the Southeast Asia and et cetera involved? Not only when you identify the gap, then you can actively present and actively connect to the businesses. And as I mentioned before, if there is a clear win-win, then there should be no problem that both organizations can work together. Once you've identified the gaps, then you realize what's stopping me from helping you. You can then connect. So our mission with YLN, we wanna be the tissue of organizations to businesses. We wanna be that middle man, middle woman um, to each organization to really find out what they need in order to succeed. How we plan on doing this and how we hope to connect everyone on the online today and in person is also create a platform, a platform where we can see what is the missing pieces between these organizations and businesses. So hopefully once our platform is up and running, you'll be able to clearly see from around the world what everyone is working on, how you can get involved, and also share this with potential sponsors, partners, or businesses that want to get included in. The great thing about this group that we're on the call with right now and also YLN is we have a very specific target market. Our target mar market is youth under 30. Again, we are open to everyone, but that is our target market. That target market is very similar to many businesses around the world, whether you're talking about Coca-Cola all the way to in academic institutions. They really want to know what this demographic is up to so then they can indeed improve their products and businesses. So again, we hope to create this platform where we really can show people where the gaps are and where the youth are filling them. And then again, how they can connect and benefit businesses. One of the last couple comments I wanna make specifically to this question is because we're linking and connecting different organizations together, what's the next step after that? Yes, we've identified the gaps. Yes, we've identified the potential partnerships between the two cross sections, but then how do we take this connectivity and different organizations to the limelight? So something that's very important to us at YLN, and I know also um, at the UN and WAS, is promotion and sharing projects. If it wasn't for calls like this or the webinar we did past Sunday, I would not know what's going on in Nepal, or I would not know about um, a farm project in Africa. 
just because we're having all these webinars and listening and hearing what Fridays of the Future are doing, we're able to connect and see gaps. I mentioned this previously in our, our former webinar, but I'm very passionate about policy change and political science. However, I'm not an expert in climate change, um, especially in different areas of, of the world. So for me to sit on these calls that are organized by WAS, YLN, the UN, we were able to listen, digest, and then maybe make a difference and start connecting all the different individual siloed organizations and being that middleman to connect them with mentors and businesses. I think everyone on this panel has been a part of many different webina webinars and they've seen and learned so many different things that are happening from across the globe where it's now the time to start connecting these organizations. Why should someone in Brazil be working on human sex trafficking while someone in Indonesia is also working on human sex, sex trafficking and they're not even talking? So by connecting these different organizations around the world, we'll be able to then create a bigger unit to then approach organizations like businesses, UN, institutional academia, and create a united front. So that is our main goal with YLN, is to create a platform and a network where we have more people joining projects, more knowledge of projects happening globally, and create this unit, united front. So when we do approach businesses and go for the mentorship programs or asking for grants and funding, which is so important to all of NGOs, we're able to go and be confident. And these are all the people that support us. So those are just from my entrepreneurial hat and also my NGO hat, my answers to your specific actionable steps to get more sustainable outcomes. Thank you, Jerry. Just one quick question. When, when is the platform going live? Do you have any time for it? So we do have a website up and running now. We're working with the developers as we've been digesting information from all of our network about what they truly want to see. Because as I mentioned, we're trying to fill the gap. Um, we are hoping 2021 we will have that and you guys will all be invited to a webinar where we're going to kick off. And again, our mission is to elevate all of you. We're, we don't take any limelight. We are the middleman of saying, how can I help each of your NGOs be more successful? That is our underlying goal. Great. Thank you. So I will present our third speaker. Uh, it's Dr. Ash Pachauri, Senior Mentor, Protect Our Planet Movement, which was co-founded with and inspired by his late father, Dr. Pachauri, former chairman of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The POP movement's uh, aim is to empower youth to play an active role in addressing issues of climate change faced by our planet. Dr. Pacharis is also the president and founder of the Center for Human Progress in India. Hello, and uh, thank you for, for joining us today. So um, my first question for you is, how can youth networks and NGOs working in different fields combine their membership and resources to foster the emergence of global social movements for actions to promote the common good of all humanity. So it's, it's, it's a kind of, it's a continuation actually of all the topics. So this is just, you know, your, your inputs on this one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I just want to say how delighted I am to be here and I'd like to convey my warmest greetings to all uh, and also convey my, my thanks Thanks to, um, to the panelists and, and the opening uh, remarks and the remarks that, that have, uh, have been shared with us uh, prior to my uh, opportunity to speak. I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the World Academy and UNOG for giving us this space and allowing us to amplify our voices. And, and on the subject of amplifying our voices, I'd like to start by saying that um, this is a really interesting question, uh, Olina. Thank you so much for asking. And I'd like to provide a little bit of a context, if I may. Uh, we're living through an unprecedented period in history with COVID-19 uh, uh, and the pandemic situation that we're faced with. But what I wanna highlight, really looking at this whole idea of multilateralism and looking at how communities and youth and movements can come together is to recognize that actually COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic is really about multiple pandemics. And, 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 the, and the situation that we're faced with has also exposed very deep fault lines that exist in modern society. Whether we look at fake news or misinformation or the infodemic, issues of food security, 
uh, and, and equality, gender inequality, more like it, the climate crisis, human rights, and also the issue of poverty. The truth is that we are living through an unprecedented humanitarian crisis that's brimming with multiple pandemics, which require multilateral and participatory solutions. And I want to really move beyond looking at this whole issue from uh, sort of just the point of view of understanding there's an approach to really being able to adopt it from the point of view of a lot of the movements that we're talking about today. And some of, some of my co-panelists have, have alluded to that. But what I'd like to say is that it's really important for us to be able to stop for just a minute and take a, a breath and peek into the past as we think about how we want to move, move forward. And what is really important is to consider what the pandemic has taught us and what history has taught us. And historically, if you think about the moments when things have broken down, it's been when people have gotten up and turned that adversity to action. And that's how movements have happened. And that's how civil rights were won. And that's how freedom was won. And so what I wanna say is that um, we recently, in fact, uh, just marked the a century mark of multilateralism. And, and at the same time, think about it, the pandemic has revealed that we really can't make progress and tackle any of these issues that confront us without multilateral events. And you know, we've seen that in addressing the economic crises that we're facing, the vaccination crises that we're facing. So no matter what it is, it's gonna take bringing people together. But at the same time, I want us to understand that while we're talking about multilateralism and, and trilateralism and collective approaches, we also coincidentally, paradoxically, are living through a time of extreme nationalism and, and rapidly driven uh, approaches that are really inward looking and isolationist. So as a strong advocate for and, and a voice of youth and social movements, what I want to underscore is that on the flip side, Today, we have 1.8 billion youth in the world, who, um, who, many of whom are already engaged with, concerned about, and participating in building our future as leaders of today and leaders of tomorrow. But what I also want to say is that for those, there are many who are not engaged. We need to ensure that we have equal spaces for them to amplify their voices and, and also to support their engagement, which is meaningful. We, uh, and I, I wanna give an example from the POP or Protect Our Planet movement, um, which recently conducted a festival in the first week of December, 2020. And the event reached over half a million people. This was a five day event. We reached over half a million people and, and, and embraced 60 partners, 58, heads of states and governments, and youth, and youth from around the world. But I want to highlight that there were several indigenous and marginalized communities. And, and from, we, had, we had about 75 countries from around the world. And I think um, in addition to the festival and initiatives that we have worked with very closely, what I want to say is that we want to recognize that it's going to take really having participatory bottom-up approaches of, to amplifying our voices and bringing action, unifying that action and being truly inclusive, mind you, not tokenistic in our approaches founded on, which need to be founded on love, trust and respect for all. And these spaces, and, and I'm gonna say this over and over, need to be filled with hope. And that is really crucial. We have a window of opportunity. And that time that we need to seize and the opportunity we need to seize is now. So these, these are spaces that need to be co-owned. It can't belong to anybody. And I, I think Jody really brought that up in the example that she highlighted is that they need to, that, that, for example, this platform is really co-owned. But also at the same time, I think it's really, really important to understand that we must in, in, in embrace diversity and inclusion, especially of those who are often excluded. And I think the issue of even technology being one of those factors that, that creates that exclusion. But most often the people who are excluded are the ones who are on the front lines bearing the brunt of all the crises that in fact we are talking about addressing. So there's no way for us to do this really without them. And I think these crises can only be tackled 
with collective action, collective voice, and a common platform founded on trust and science, credible information, facts, and a long-term vision. We really need to move away from our current approaches that are myopic and serve the near-term gains of just a few. And I'm finally gonna just say to redesign platforms and paradigms based on collaboration and, and collective vision, we must embrace, um, uh, Olina, exactly what you brought up, the true spirit of we, the people, because we are all one and we must rise to embrace the universe as our global family, which is really something we live by um, and, and keep very close to our heart at the pop movement. As youth movements are, are entering into a new era of multilateralism partnership, and I hope much more of that in terms of collaboration, we must also embrace cross-generational learning and respect for experience and traditional wisdom, which comes from a lot of the indigenous communities. And, and these new cultures of intergenerational exchange and leadership must be strengthened. And we must also understand that really leadership is about a process of learning together and co-creating. So once again, here we are at that point and a critical juncture and moment in history. So the question is, are we gonna rise above and take action? Are we gonna do this in a true spirit of collaboration? At this moment, um, I just wanna say that I hope we will get together and translate adversity one more time to action and do so as a universal family. That's really what it's gonna depend on. And I'm also gonna say that, Olina, since you introduced the pop movement as an organization dad and I founded, my dad once said to me, and I quote, we are one for all and all for one. And I really hope that what we're gonna do now will be founded on that principle and philosophy. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Um, Very motivational as well. <laughs> Not only a reply, but also very motivational speech. Thank you. Um, I would like to move on our, to our fourth panelist, Luke, Luke Addison. So Luke uh, is a UK Rotaract chair and founder of Rotaract in Winchester. So he knows how to build a, or an organization from scratch and, and get people together. Luke joins Rotaract because he believes passionately in connecting with other young people who think the same as him, but also learning so much from the others who don't. This is the information I found about you when I was researching about our panelists. Luke has traveled the world, including Monaco, as initially a Rotaract member and is heavily involved in Peace Jam youth conferences and slams around the world. He has also been working on setting up the Rotaract e-club for Great Britain and Ireland. Uh, and this is something that I discovered about, about your work and connecting a little bit with what Jody was saying in her work, um, I wanted to, to, to ask you, can you talk more about setting up the, uh, the Rotaract eClub? Because today we're talking about creating a, a more quantifiable and measurable metrics for civil society organizations. And going digital is one of the key challenges for membership-based organizations such as Rotaract. So can you share your experience of setting this up for, for Rotaract, please? Thank you, Luke. Thank you, uh, Olina. Um, first of all, just to start by saying what an absolute challenge to go last and to follow the three of you. Uh, the three of you are absolutely exceptional and I, I've learned more in the last 30 minutes than I think I have all year on Zoom calls. So what a, a pleasure to, to join a panel with the three of you. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my experience um, in setting up the Rotaract group and then leading that into working with an organization called Peace Jam. So I was studying at university in Winchester in the UK, 2014, uh, studying to become a drama teacher trying to find um, experience in the local area. Uh, it's very difficult um, as lots of schools don't take you in when you don't have experience. I was connected to an organization called uh, the Winchester Rotary Club. Uh, Rotary is an international organization that's essentially a group of local um, professionals and activists who get together, use their resources and their know-how to, to kind of benefit the local community whilst working with them. So we started working on a few projects with them. Um, they had a few things coming up. Um, and eventually, after working with them for a few months, we were offered the opportunity to set up our own youth group. The youth group of Rotary is called Rotaract, it's a bit cheesy, but means Rotaract, Rotary in action. Um, we said, what is it? What do we do? They said, you just need to get some members. You just need to find some local projects. So being at university, our main body of um, uh, members were students. And we obviously just had to look around a local area for projects to get involved in, people to work with. 
and it turned out that one of our members uh, was made homeless. Uh, so straight away, obviously, homelessness was a very in-our-face um, project to take on. We started working with local organisations um, to battle homelessness, working with the Rotary Club and also working with other um, organisations as well. Um, a little while later, a year later, I was elected to work on the kind of district level. So Rotary and Rotaract run on a kind of local district national level, um, where I worked with the kind of other Rotaract clubs across Hampshire, where we all kind of joined up on projects we were doing, had social events, obviously got to know each other. Um, and a year after that, I was elected to the national chair of the UK, which again is working with all of the Rotaract clubs in the UK, as well as being connected to Rotaract across the world, which is over 10,000 clubs and over 200,000 members, um, very similar to something like JCI, which Alina mentioned earlier, um, in the sense of obviously making friends and doing um, social action projects as well. So we had an international event last uh, two years ago in Hamburg, where we saw lots of Rotaract leaders from across the world meet up together um, and um, collaborate on projects and share ideas and events. Um, and our own Rotaract club, which was still local at this point, Winchester, was still running, still running projects, now being led by someone else and is still running today, six years later. Um, as well as being connected to the Rotary Club, which gave us some kind of professional networks and some really good friends in the community, um, we were also connected to an organization called Peace Jam. So Peace Jam is a um, global education organization working with Nobel Peace laureates like the Dalai Lama, Desmond Tutu and young people, basically hosting conferences, bringing the laureate to that conference, humanizing them, getting them completely involved in the weekend, and then having a mentoring system where young people basically take on groups of 10 to 15 school students and do anything from sort of discussions and talking about various things around the world. Um, during those conferences, there's the opportunity for social impact projects where they go out into the community and do some useful work. So it's not just a sat, sit down, clap, listen conference. Um, and obviously, as we had the road track set up at Winchester, um, we set up a Peace Jam also at the university. That was in 2015. Uh, we've had four um, annual conferences that have each had Nobel laureates and each had about 200 young people from the community from all diverse backgrounds who obviously have taken part in that conference over the weekend. Um, and again, the mentors that we had to find who would be the mentors to the school students were primarily made up of our Rotaract Club as well as students in the university. So we're creating this really interesting cycle of if you came to the University of Winchester, you could join a Rotaract Club and you could also take part in a Peace Jam conference each year. So Peace Jam since then has grown. Um, we were able to influence other young people from around Europe who had been attending our Peace Jams in Winchester to do the same thing. Um, so working with their networks, their teachers, there's now Peace Jam set up across Europe, in Greece, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, each of which have had conferences um, and obviously are doing their own projects alongside conferences. Um, this group of young people, um, we were approached by Peace Jam to join a kind of logistical board meeting we were offered some um, opportunities to suggest our thoughts on improvements and we said that Peace Jam should be a lot more youth led. Obviously it, it works with loads of young people, but there's not that many young people in the leadership positions. So they created a whole new opportunity, which is called the Youth Leadership Team. Um, and we have about 30 of us who are young people from across Europe who sit in this group, um, organize content for conferences, run our own projects um, and also kind of function as a network for our own organizations and our other kind of areas of expertise as well. And that is also joined by many Rotaract members from across the world as well. So just by setting that Peace Jam up and creating that initial kind of local community of, of people trying to do some work, we've set this thing up and we, we're just launching the kind of European youth team um, at the start of this next year um, to start running projects, produce some newsletters, um, put on events, and kind of are looking for as many kind of young people and, and collaboration networks as possible. So really interested to hear what comes from most of this talk, as it sounds like the three of you are advocating for, if not in the process of doing similar things. So um, I think that's about five minutes. Thanks so much for um, having me here and looking forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you very much, Luke, for um, keeping an eye on time. <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to get back to, um, I'd like to get back to 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 actually to Ekasa because we we've done our kind of first round of questions and and I would like to maybe look a bit more focused in in the first questions to which you've replied. So Ekasa, my question, my second question for you is is 
what 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 in your opinion what are the um what are the measures that can be utilized to enhance the active participation and effective role of next generation youth networks in the multilateral system so it's all kind of building on your previous answer and also what we have just spoken about uh, with the other panelists thank you Absolutely. Thank you very much for the question. And once again, I think it's a very important question that uh, needs to be addressed. And, you know, there's an oft repeated statement that I hear uh, that young people are our future leaders. And for me, nothing could be more condescending and presumptuous because we children and youth are today's leaders and must be recognized accordingly. And it's this preconceived mindset that is the greatest stumbling block to our engagement and our inclusivity. Because young people have always been at the forefront of driving change. This is not a new phenomenon, but the Western media only picks and chooses what they feel makes for a good story. And quite often this typecasts young people incorrectly. And we're not just protesters and strikers. Our work goes beyond holding up placards and marching on the streets. And the large majority of us have been working on mitigating climate change, on stopping land degradation and biodiversity conservation for several years, recognizing the critical need for localized solutions. And I began my grassroots work 12 years ago as an eight-year-old. And since then, Green Hope Foundation has evolved as a global social innovation enterprise working in 25 countries where our 130,000 children and youth are engaging local communities in building resilience to the impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss. And through our efforts, we've regenerated thousands of square kilometers of mangrove ecosystems in the Middle East, in Indonesia, in Suriname, in the Bahamas, and in the Sundarbans spanning both India and Bangladesh. And in 2017, we actually started a mangrove uh, reforestation project in the islands of the Sundarbans that had been devastated by Cyclone Isla. And uh, as a result of this reforestation, these communities did not actually get as affected as much by the recent Cyclone Amphan that hit the region earlier this year. But of course, work like this isn't glamorous enough to make it to Western TV channels, but that does not mean that it's not happening or that people are focusing on climate change only now because of recent protests. And what works for us in the developed world will not work in the global South. Because how can you strike and shout slogans about missing school when you don't have the opportunity to go to school, when you don't have food to eat, don't have proper shelter? So we need to localize the sustainable development goals and our solutions and to echo my fellow panelists to ensure the active participation of young people, we must reach out to those who are the farthest first. And at the same time, we must improve the engagement of children and youth in the developed nations. Because for both, the one thing that's missing is awareness. Because even in the most developed nations, environmental sustainability education is not part of the curriculum. And I saw in the comments that someone actually wrote about that. And here in Canada, we are working with the Toronto District School Board, the country's largest, with 600 schools and 250,000 students as an environmental education partner, teaching their students about sustainability because that is not yet part of the curriculum. And it's at this impressionable age that we must change our, the behaviors. We must dispel this myth that only adults can understand climate change and sustainability and take actions while youth should only protest. Children take to nature instinctively and our workshops with children, some as young as six, be it in a Manhattan public school or in a Syrian refugee camp in no man's land and along the Lebanon-Syria border have demonstrated that irrespective of age or situation, children and youth can take mitigation actions. And at our sustainability academies, I mentioned earlier, we use education for sustainable development. And this actually enables them to view their current challenges as one's own and shows them how to approach it at a grassroots level. And on the face of it, all of these sustainability issues, be it global warming or gender inequality, might be uh, difficult for children to understand, especially as the majority of the youth whom we engage with have never been to school. 
And since our work is global, there is the additional dimensions of language and social strictures, particularly for girls and women. So to circumvent these issues, we use innovative non-formal communication modes in our advocacy, such as art, dance, music, sport, drama, to spread awareness. And our academies also incorporate STEM education to build the necessary skill sets amongst the participants. And then armed with this knowledge, the academy participants venture out within their own local communities, taking those definitive steps towards conservation, thereby localizing the SDGs and recognizing the unique challenges that each region faces. And Green Hope works with them on the implementation of these campaigns, ranging from you know, tree planting, cleanups, uh, biodiversity conservation, to urban sustainability, to gender parity, workshops on sanitation and protection from sexual assault, to adoption of clean energy. So what I'm trying to say is that we cannot depend on others to empower us. That will never happen. We need to take the reins of our destiny in our own hands and education is going to be the catalyst for that change. So my call is therefore for equitable access to education using technology whenever possible, especially in the current crisis and bridging the digital divide and opportunity gaps so that over time, not a single child is ever left out of school. And we're not demanding a seat at the table just because of our age. It's all because of our capability. So judge us for our work and look at us as equals and look at, and do not judge us based on our age, judge us on our capability. Thank you for this. Um, and actually I'm taking note of the, uh, of the suggestion about uh, sustainability and, and making sustainability and teaching uh, kids sustainability as part of the curriculum because it's true I myself am involved in education business and it's a big topic that we discuss for example with my colleagues in the schools um, and I've seen there was a suggestion about this as well in the in the comment section so this is something that we will relate to the to the organizers of the conference thank you very much I would like to continue with Jody. Um, and actually, the, the next question that I have ready prepared for you is probably kind of looking deeper down, deeper into what you're already doing with the building of, of, of the platform that is the, the kind of middleman for, for various NGOs. So in, 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 in your plan, essentially, what steps do you think can be taken to, general, to generate reliable data on the membership magnitude actions and achievements of social movements in order to improve understanding of their effectiveness and draw lessons from their experience because you know it's all about data nowadays and collecting information and numbers so yeah the only thing is that i would just like to remind about time we have 17 minutes left so i will start you know being <laughs> careful with that thank you jody great and i just set a timer so i'll make sure not to go over I am really excited about what everyone is saying. I think in general, there is not a lack of motivation or a lack of energy um, behind youth movements. What I do think there is a lack of is data and how do you actively take data and utilize them to ensure that you will be successful growing your organization. So oftentimes we do see these energetic youth movements and it, it's a really good feel good movement. However, most of them are not sustainable or some of them do not last longer than a few years with small amount of membership due to the fact that we are not taking data more seriously. So again, keep in mind, I am coming from a company that only works with data. So I may be a little obsessed with data and the importance of it moving forward with growing your organization. But I think it's really important if anyone is leading or if anyone is a part of an organization to get really specific with your members. And especially because YLN, we work globally, our strategy around the world has to be very specific and very unique. And I like what Ash said earlier about the bottom-up approach. That is so important for any youth organization to be mobilized and to be heard and to feel continued motivation. This top-down approach where you, you often see in a lot of different organizations, whether that's business, academia, and et cetera, it's very one size fits all. And the approach that we need to move forward in is a customized approach. So something that may be working for Luke in the UK doesn't necessarily um, 
reside with members that may be working in the US or in Asia or in Africa. So we have to make sure when we do look at our data with our members, we know exactly who they are, what their mission is, we know their cultural background and preferences, we know their gender, we know their age. And then when we start to map and image who exactly is our network, then we can better place, better mobilize and better motivate our group and network. So I would say collecting data is very important. Two, I would say, talk to your members, talk to the people that are helping organization, talk to partners, check in on them every once in a while, just to ask them a generic set of questions. How are you feeling? Or what certain goals are you trying to hit this year? And what's stopping you? A constant reoccurring conversation with people um, that achieves your overall goal will not only give you more data about where the slow parts is, but also corresponds with what season are people most proactive? What time of the day will people most willingly respond to do work? So again, it's these little data points that you want to collect individually with your members, holistically as your organization, but externally with your partnerships as well. I will now begin to kind of actionize um, going from bottom up, not just members, but with projects specifically. I know everyone on the panel and hopefully those that are in the chat um, have a project they're passionate about or are looking to get into a project they're passionate about. But what's important, and I think what we're going to promote at YLN, and Luke mentioned this as well, is starting local. Um, so yes, there's a lot of global organizations that have a lot of great big ideas, but in order to generate data fast, start local. So for example, in Atlanta, we are starting a launch library and we're working with the juvenile system. So people that are um, under the age of 18 that are currently in jail, that will be rejoining society in the next couple months. So what we're actively doing is we're going inside the prisons, really figuring out what they need help with in order to be a productive member of society. So this is very, very local, specific to my city. However, because we are we noticed that there was this gap in our society of the transition between juvenile system and real world. We then can maybe franchise and go bigger and then make them mobile civil society um, stronger just past Atlanta, Georgia. So that's something that I recommend. And not only with starting local, the next step would then be to share and promote. Again, I mentioned this earlier, but it's really important for me to explain what we're doing here. And then hopefully that resonates with Ash or with Luke or with our first speaker about how they can see what I'm doing locally to benefit their local community. And then we're slowly creating data, cross-functional data between this country, this city, this um, county, and then we can bring it to a larger scale. So I know I have only a minute left. I'm timing myself. Um, but I just want to mention something that David from the UN said in our um, webinar Wednesday that so often with social movements, people favor, um, they have a favor flavor of the week, I would say. So, you know, this year it was Greta, um, last couple of years it was Malala. There's different people that end up shining. Um, so how do we really make those others that aren't being heard feel that same kind of movement and motivation? And again, I would bring this back on collecting your data, know your audience, know your partnerships, and then creating this united front moving forward. So that is exactly five minutes. And um, thank you again for the interesting question. And I hope everyone moves forward in collecting the proper data in order for them to sustainably move forward with their organization. Thank you very much, Jody. I really, I love data, so <laughs> I, uh... Uh, this is something that I, I, I like listening and, and talking about as well. And I know the importance of, of data because later on, this is how you can quantify your impact. This is how you can sell your services to partners. That's what, you know, that's how you can measure essentially what you do. Um, okay, so back to Ash. We have 11 minutes left. So I'll really ask it to be five minutes tops because then we have to start wrapping up. Um, so Ash, this is the question I asked before, but I know that you're, you're keen on, on, on this topic. So what measures, in your opinion, can be utilized to enhance the active participation and effective role of next generation youth networks in the multilateral system? Thank you, Alina. I'll keep it, I'll keep it as crispy as possible. 
Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a little bit upon uh, what, um, you know, what my co-panelists, uh, including what Jody just said. I'm going to underscore a few things. And what I want to say is that it's, it's critical for us to be able to to really bring in partnerships uh, and, and create measures that are founded on a few different things. First off, I think the most important thing is to start to look at action. You know, we really need to move beyond dialogue and rhetoric and start focusing on action. And again, I'm gonna highlight what I said in the first, uh, you know, first instance that I had an opportunity to speak, that we do have a window of opportunity that window of opportunity is closing and it's really important for us to be able to come together and affect change and it can only happen through action. It is gonna take, um, a, a, like, um, you know, uh, uh, Ms. Basu just said that, you know, youth are re really leaders of today and tomorrow. And what I, I want to say is that bringing youth to the fore we're gonna need to bring everybody into the fold. It can't be just a select group of young people. And for that, in order to be able to really affect change on the ground, we're gonna need to start to look at sub-national initiatives as well. Yes, we need to look global. Yes, we need to look national, but we're gonna look, we're gonna need to look at sub-national as well, because if you're gonna really bring everybody um, on, on the same page with us, then we're going to need to have action at uh, you know rural uh, in remote areas in rural areas and all over uh, and it, it's going to mean mean going down on the ground and then finally what i want to say is also that education is going to be a very critical part of um, what we call in fact after the pop movement something called youth inspired by knowledge and so education and science needs to be a critical part of what this action is going to be all about and be driven by that science. And that is a crucial part of it. Finally, um, uh, you know, bringing people together into multilateral spaces and creating movements will require us to focus on cross-sharing. It's going to mean amplifying voices. It is going to mean bringing people together. It is going to mean in involving and engaging people in a meaningful manner. But what it's gonna mean also is that we start to share, we start to exchange. And we do that in as many ways, using data, using other forms of communication that are creative, acceptable. And what is crucial is that if we're talking about sustainable development here, then sustainable responses will have to mean being local and culturally relevant as well. And therefore, a fundamental part of this is really looking at forms of communication that are relevant to local geographies. And those vary dramatically from places where we have bright lights, big cities, and, and uh, high-speed internet being very different to those that are in rural spaces. So really being as relevant as possible. And I know that this point was brought up earlier, and I'm gonna highlight it, that you know, using creative means such as uh, inter entertainment education, including art, music, dance, theater, which have been used historically, um, are a very powerful tool that transcend a lot of barriers as far as culture and language are concerned. And so I'm gonna say that it takes being creative, it does mean being uh, local and relevant. And at the same time, I think, yes, absolutely, we need to be able to be focused on, on impact and numbers and understanding data and, and also embracing other forms of communication, which make it relevant to the geographies that we're talking about. And, um, and again, I'm gonna say amplifying voices because those are, those are, when people have gotten together and amplified their voices and they've shared their stories have been moments when things have changed. And so that is a critical part of really supporting, facilitating and sustaining the change that we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ash. Thank you. So Luke, back to you. And this is going to be last question from, from me. Um, it's, it's also kind of very hands-on, very specific question. Um, in your opinion, how can the public impact of existing UN initiatives be enhanced by collaboration with parliaments, cities, businesses, academia, NGOs, educational institutions, and other civil society organizations? And I'll probably like write everything down. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Sure. So, of course. So, I mean, it's very difficult to speak on behalf of, of, of what the UN itself should do. However, the UN uh, is an organization that works a lot with young people, has its own institutions in place, could maybe use a lot more young people in certain areas. And something that's really helped mobilize the work that we've been doing, certainly within Rotary and within Peace Jam, is similarly to the UN, we're working with organizations that are already established, you know, big NGOs, worldwide charities. And we are a group of young people trying to not only kind of connect with them, but, you know, do the work that they're doing as well. And youth, you know, unfortunately, similarly to peace is a, is a word that can be thrown around quite a lot and, um, you know, really promoted, but little be done for it. You know, lots of organizations support peace, support youth, but when you dig down, like what are they actually doing? So many times, I'm sure we've been all been to conferences where there's a speaker talking about the theme of youth, who's a little bit older, maybe gray hair, who talks a little bit too long, realizes they've overrun and said, oh, you know, we've only got time for a few questions, you know, because they've overrun, you know, and then they're talking about empowering the youth, you know, and the irony of those situations, you know, we find all the time where it's a lot of backpacking, back patting goes on where organizations claim to give us roles and responsibilities, but they're not. So the two examples that I shared with Rotary and with Peace Jam are just examples where this has worked very well. And they weren't necessarily, um, you know, ex opportunities and responsibilities that were handed to us charitably. Many times we had to, to ask for them several times. We had to challenge for them and we had to fight to get them, you know, which is, which is just as valuable as well. So we were given these responsibilities by Rotary, you know, to run our own organization, to take control of it, to fundraise our own um, resources, but also to be connected to them. Um, eventually that relationship built up into having our members on their leadership boards, on their committees with access to budgets, the same as their members do. And it was that seeing us as equals that really, really benefited the work that we're doing and, and where we are now. Similarly to Peace Jam, you know, when we approached the organization and we were asked for our thoughts and we said, well, a little bit more could be done or a lot more could be done in youth representation on the board, in actually the, the control of, the, of the, the conferences and the things that we're doing. To which they said, okay, how about a youth leadership team that kind of functions as its, its own board, but the members of that board also sit on the wider board and communicate, you know, let's not, it's not about two separate boards, it's about the, the network together, seeing each other as equals, you know, and the, the membership of this board is, is incredibly diverse from both sides. And it's that, you know, non patronizing kind of genuine respect and genuine um, recognition of the importance of our role that has pushed us so far that has allowed us to do the things that we're doing, you know, working in a big global network, like not feeling like we're, you know, unpaid interns, you know, or not feeling like we're, we're not valued, you know, we're, we could say to them, we want to do an event on this or a project on this and be listened to and help to do it, you know, and, and connected to a network that contains Nobel Peace Laureates, you know, to push that. So we're, we're so lucky. And you know, many organizations that I've met, you know, in similar positions, um, the organization in the UK called Restless Development, which kind of caps the age of members to kind of 35 which it you know, keeps a real consistent young people flow of leadership throughout. And then other organizations you know, that could do a lot better um, in you know, giving young people a voice and giving them a real platform that's not just a panel on a speaker, a speaker on a panel, you know, and not just a kind of ceremonial event talking about young people and then they leave you know, being right up there you know, with the decision-making um, people as well. So that would be my advice, I guess, to the UN on what they should do, but also just to wider um, organizations themselves, you know, who want to work closely with young people. Great. Thank you very much. And um, with this, I'd like to, to maybe draw a little um, conclusion for, for today's session, because um, uh, as everybody probably noticed, I'm very concerned with the data and time. <laughs> So um, thank you very, very much to everybody to jo for joining us today. Jody Gakinsan, who's joined uh, from uh, you know, um, early, early, early morning. Um, what we will do then, we will, um, I, will, I will work on everything you said, and I will create a, a kind of working paper, which will have recommendations that, that then will be sent to the organizers of the conference. And I'm absolutely sure that this is not the last time that we are all connecting with each other. I would love to, to, to connect with you after the, uh, after the panel. And um, yes, yeah, so it was extremely productive. It was 
very um, uh, fruitful and very intellectually challenging as well. So I would like to thank each one of you and wish you all the best and, and lots of luck. And I hope that we will meet in person as soon as possible. Um, I hope, uh, you know, in the next in the next month. So thank you very much, everybody, uh, for participating. And I will see you soon. Have a nice day.